Shalom, I am Nami Melumad, and I'm the composer of Star Trek Prodigy and Star Trek Strange New Worlds, and you are listening to Trek Untold. Welcome to Trek Untold, Star Trek podcast that goes beyond the stars. I'm your host, Matthew Kaplowitz. Star Trek is nothing without its music, and for this franchise, it is a huge part of it. The legacy of its composers is a grand one, with some true legends and luminaries etched into its history. From Gerald Freed to Jerry Goldsmith to Dennis McCarthy and more, the names of these music makers are truly outstanding. Today, I have the privilege to have a composer who is making huge waves in the industry, as well as in Star Trek to join this show, and that name is Nami Malamud. You've heard Nami's work in Star Trek for several years now, in fact, starting with the Short Trek episode Q&A, and followed by her work composing on Prodigy and Strange New Worlds. Most importantly though, Nami is the first woman ever to compose for Star Trek in its over 55 year history. That's quite a breakthrough, but it's one that is well earned by Nami. Talking to her, you might be surprised to find out that she's not some snooty, pretentious classical musician, but really a bubbly and highly intelligent person that loves what she does with a great passion and enormous enthusiasm for it. This international award-winning musician has also composed scores for Thor Love and Thunder, Absentia, Dead End, Disney's Far From the Tree, and a whole lot more through her very prolific career. I feel very privileged that I got to spend this time with Nami and pick her brain on how she works, especially from that Star Trek angle. And I'm just as excited today to share these stories with you on this episode. So please enjoy this very insightful and extremely fun conversation with Nami Melamud. But before we begin this week's episode, I want to remind you to follow Trek Untold on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Trek Untold, all one word. You can get show updates, check out some fun memes, and let me know what you think about what's going on with the current events in the Star Trek universe. You can also support this show directly on Patreon at patreon.com slash Trek Untold, where you can support this show for as little as $2 a month. At higher tiers, you can listen to the shows before they come out, know about my guests well in advance, and even have a chance to ask them questions, get transcripts of these episodes to make sure you get all the info, and more benefits coming soon, including watch parties and live streams. But that's all dependent on more fans like you coming over and letting me know you want to be a part of events like that. If you want some Trek Untold merchandise, check out our Teespring store for gear and apparel, including shirts, hats, stickers, water bottles, notebooks, and a whole lot more. New designs will be added throughout the year, so it's always worth taking a peek. Trek Untold also has an Amazon shop where you can peruse everything Star Trek, sci-fi, and geeky on Amazon in one convenient location. If you're looking for a gift for the Trekkie in your life, or maybe want to see some of my favorite non-Star Trek things that you can get for yourself, check out the link for my Amazon shop in the show notes on the audio version and in the description below this video on YouTube. If you're listening to us on iTunes or any other audio platforms that allow for ratings and reviews, please leave us a five-star rating and a positive review to help out this show. If you're watching it on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe to us at youtube.com at Trek Untold and give the video a thumbs up and a comment. All of these things help more people find this show and to continue growing and bringing you awesome guests each and every week. Now, without further ado, let's beam in this week's guest. Computer, access interview file. And welcome back to Trek Untold. And joining us on the other side of the screen, we have Nami Melumad, composer extraordinaire and the first woman ever to score a Star Trek series. Nami, how are you today? I feel great. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for being here. And folks who are not watching the video version or listening to the audio, uh, I have to make sure they understand you're wearing a Star Trek sweatshirt right now, Star Trek hoodie, um, which yes. is really awesome. <laughs> this is actually a Prodigy crew it's... booty. So in the back, it says uh, Prodigy. I can try to... Oh, that is official. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm... I like wearing uh, Star Trek stuff. You know, I normally I also drink from Star Trek mugs and my mom, uh, she's just visiting from overseas and she's like, why is why is your entire closet filled with Star Trek shirts? And like, <laughs> like well, 
<laughs> Why not? Trying them, uh, and I'm like, no, <laughs> I will not. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's fun. You 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 know, I get to work on on what I love. So that's how rare is that? You know? Yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty awesome. And I did some research into you, and I and I this is my first question I ask all my guests, and I feel like you're gonna have a really great answer for this, because um, it seems like you are a pretty hardcore fan. So I would love to know what is your earliest memory of Star Trek. Um, my earliest memory of Star Trek is actually not a very, uh, like, uh, positive one, actually, because <laughs> I, I didn't, you know, I, I grew up in the 90s, right? I, I was born in 88. Uh, and so the show that was on was, was TNG. And uh, I was born in Israel, and I did not speak English. <laughs> and I didn't read the subtitles because this was like, you know, Nine, like very, I was like maybe first or second grade, like it was too quick. Um, and I, I didn't really understand what's, what, what are all these costumes? <laughs> like these people, like the, you know, they're, they're, they have Romulans. Like it was, it looked really weird <laughs> to a kid like me who had no background in like my family, they, they didn't really watch it. Like it was just, you know, sometimes you would, you'd, you know, try things on the TV and this, this was on, but like, I didn't, you know, nobody watched it like in, in my circle and I didn't really know anything about it. So that's my, my first memory of Star Trek is like, you know, seeing the Picard team and like not, not understanding any of it. And like, these are wearing like, like, you know, blue uniforms. This is like the, 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 the red uniform is like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> so it was like way later on where I actually, I started developing this interest in film music and then from that, I was exposed to like a lot of music, a lot of sci-fi music I didn't even, you know, know existed. And I, it's, it's, it's kind of similar with Star Wars. I heard the Star Wars theme, like, you know, all the John Williams stuff, like <laughs> the, the Imperial March, all of that way before I watched any of the films. Interesting. <laughs> and so the same thing happened with Star Trek where I listened to the Jerry Goldsmith theme from, from the motion picture and the Alexander Courage theme for, for the original series. And that, that was like long before I even like, the same actually with even Michael's score, to be honest, I heard it before uh, in 2000, before I actually watched it. But, but yeah, so what I'm saying is like that the music was so great. I was like, I need to check this out, <laughs> you know? Um, so then I actually watched things by order. I watched, but I, sorry, I watched them by order of production. So, you know, it was the first, uh, the original series. And then it was, um, TNG and then it was Voyager actually before DS9. I wasn't sure. I think I think Voyager was made before. Uh, DS9 Probably. came first. Oh, okay. So I that was actually not by order. Then I watched Voyager and then I watched DS9. But it was approximately yeah. You know, it was close. Yeah, they're, they're basically pretty close anyway, so it's not a big deal. Yeah, and then Enterprise, Discovery, Picard, um, Lord Dex, and I still need to go back to watch the animated series. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's a fun one to watch if you haven't seen it before. Yeah. That is a very unique version of Star Trek. Let's put it that yeah, way. I tried it. Um, I tried it. Like, you know, I watched like two episodes and it was hard, but I will give it another try. <laughs> and now I watch, uh, I watch Prodigy um, and I watch Strange New Worlds uh, with my family every time it comes out. Um, so, you know, that's nice. That's really and cool. The, I mean, normally I, I talk about Trek stuff like a little bit way later on, but in this case, you know, like, it's, it's kind oh. of rare that I talk to folks who have been in Star Trek, especially the actors, and like they usually don't even want to watch the shows they've been in or the episodes they've been in. Some do, some don't. Um, but you actually are still watching it because you're oh, still just like a fan. You want to see it. Yeah, but I also, you know, I, I do have a lot of reservations from from watching my own work. Like I don't normally do that, but this is Star Trek, so I actually enjoy it. And also, when I watch it, it's not like the final, 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 final. final. I mean, it's the final picture. Like say when we mix it and the final mix it's the final picture, you know, with effects and stuff, but sometimes it'll be still missing like color correction or, you know, they'll change an ADR thing. And I, I didn't, you know, notice it because when I was working, it didn't, you know, it didn't sound this way. They change, you know, they still make changes. Um, sometimes they will, you know, make another little change. Like they still make changes and, and, and it does eventually look different than what I seen. So I liked it, you know, cause it's Star Trek. I love to, yeah i have to see it and then i also have like you know because when i watch it i'm like oh i wish i did, did and this and that like it does happen <laughs> and it teaches you too like hey this this pat this you know this cue cap cuts through all the action or this cue 
does not. So next time I need to do this and that, you know, in order to make it work better. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's also like a lot of learning that you can do um, kind of like, you know, when, from the conclusion, you know, to take conclusions of, of how, how it sounds at the end of the day in, in the mix, like with, but not, you know, on the, on the sound stage, it always sounds great, but on a TV or on, you know, whatever screen you're watching, like, it's not always going to be like, so th there are, there are things that you can take away and, you know, see how you can make them better. Um, so there's that. All right, we're going to come back to Star Trek because I got a whole lot of questions about that because you have done so Great. much already in the Star Trek universe. But uh, I want to get a little bit more on the secret origin story of Nami here. So okay. we already know that you grew up in Israel. Um, right. So I'd love to hear a little bit about who your parents were and what they did and what little <laughs> Nami wanted to be when she grew up. Oh my, okay. Uh, well, my parents are actually not uh, musicians. My mom is a pharmacist and my dad, um, he, he's, you know, in education, he's also a pharmacist, but he, um, uh, he's running like a drug factory. Is that uh, like they're making uh, pharmaceuticals? <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> so, I like the way you said it though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of my friends uh, back home, they also like that. <laughs> <laughs> like drugs um yes uh but uh so they're in in like kind of you know more of a medical perspective of life and I actually like that too like when I grew up the you know in high school I I took chemistry and I also took music so I, I doubled triple majored really because music was like that a double major to begin with um but I wanted to keep the door open because I actually liked you know what my what my parents were doing and I I'm very like you know, I'm, I'm good with those stuff. Like I was a really good student, you know, I got what would be equivalent to A pluses like here all, you know, in the US. Um, as cause you know, we have a different system. So I, I actually like sciences a lot. Um, and I had a very strong interest in like space stuff. And this was like totally unrelated to Star Trek or Star Wars or anything. This was even before that. Like I was, um, yeah, there was this documentary series that talked about like um, <clears throat> how the Americans and, and the Russians were, you know, kind of fighting who's going to get <laughs> to space faster, who's going to land on the moon faster. There's like a, this documentary series that that totally followed all of this, and I like I watched it so many times, like you know, on screen. like it was it was uh, I still have it like on video on on VCR, like it's it's uh. I still have it. Um, and I, I kind of wanted to maybe be an astronaut, like, you know, do these things. And then I thought maybe I should work for NASA, like and not not go to space, but like, you know, stay on the ground and explore because there's so much to learn. Um, you know, there's so much we still don't know. Um, and ultimately, you know, I'm telling stories about space, but like I kind of hope that like our, you know, the stuff that I'm doing will inspire others. <laughs> To do that research that I never got to do, but that was a consideration. That was, you know, I thought about that. Um, I thought about becoming a vet, like a veterinarian, because um, I really love animals. And this, this was like another backup idea. Um, and then, uh, yeah, ultimately, and and I thought maybe to do computer stuff, like you know, to to engineer things. Um, and then ultimately, after my military service, I was working at this restaurant. And, you know, I was saving money to go to, I went to go to uh, New Zealand and Australia to kind of like travel the world. And, and I did, but before that, so I had to work um, and I was a waitress and this, that restaurant, they played the same CD over and over and over again. That sounds about right. <laughs> I was like, holy shit. Like, I mean, I cannot, I, it was just so like, I'm like, I cannot be in, a, in an environment. And that t taught me that I should not be in an, one environment all the time and do the same thing. Like it would drive me crazy. So that was one of the thoughts of like, you know, going on that dream of film scoring. Cause, oh, sorry, I should have mentioned that was also super early on. So that was another thing I wanted early on. I was like, I want to do film scores. I want to do, you know, I want to do music to tell a story. This was, I don't know, probably as early as 13, like that, that wow. idea. So you knew at 13, that was, that was what we wanted to do as your goal. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. But I, you know, there's like all these questions that you're doubting yourself because a lot of young people are like, well, you know, music, that's not sustainable. Like you need to have a career in, you know, sciences or in 
computers or and stuff that you know that are paying a lot <laughs> you know and that you could because because you know trusting that you can you're talented enough you're good enough to do you know to to sustain yourself from a musical career especially composition that's like you gotta have that confidence like it's really hard to get there sometimes and and luckily my my family was super supportive they're like you do whatever you want you're the best in everything that you do you know they're like super you know they didn't push me to that but they're like you know we'll support anything you know you want music classes you want you want to you want to get this instrument that instrument like they're so um you know they, they were just uh you know they, they are the reason that I'm doing this today because if I, I didn't have their support I would probably be like okay I'm probably, you know, gonna do something safer. Um, so I think, you know, I think parents should encourage their kids to do the, the things they love. Um, so yeah, uh, anyway, uh, so that was that. <laughs> uh, and then ultimately, uh, I, uh, I think I drove with one of my, fr two of my friends, we were driving and I, I was, it was my car. Well, my dad's car, <laughs> and then um, and and I had a CD with some demos that uh, that I did, um, you know, just just generally, you know, I I started writing very early on. It was instrumental music that sounded like film music, because that that was the idea. Um, and then a friend that one of my friends, she's like, so what what is what movie is this from? <laughs> and she thought this was an actual soundtrack, and that was like a bulb light bulb moment. And I'm like she thought this was a movie <laughs> and I'm like this is my music that I wrote in Cubates you know with using some libraries you know and I'm like okay like you know, I'm, I mean libraries is like virtual instruments so it wasn't like a recording it was just a, a, a demo uh and then I was like okay I guess I guess I can do it you know because um she thought like you know she thought it was real and, and that was uh that was I'm like I'm gonna go for it um so I did <laughs> And I'm sure we could talk about stories about the Israeli Defense Force another time. I feel like that's a whole other podcast about your time in the service. That, that is, uh, that is, it's it's a, it's great though. Um, like my service was, I mean, I wasn't combat or anything, but it, it did contribute to my life here. Like it did contribute to to the person I am. And my job was, I was an interviewer, so it was, I it really helped me to to get to know people very fast and very quickly, and like. It, super, it really helps you when you come to Hollywood <laughs> and you yeah. need to like understand who the person in front of you is very quickly and you need to make a good first impression and you need to like, you know, so that I think that was very useful, actually. Yeah, I got to pick your brain about some of those techniques uh, another time, too. But, uh, you know, let's, let's talk yeah. about coming to America, though, because, you know, at this point you've, you've done your service. Um, did you come to America to go to university or did you do that in Israel? Um, I, I came here for grad school, so okay. I did. I did undergrad in, in Jerusalem. Uh, they have uh, an academy, a music academy. Um, so there's like a, a music and dance. So it's the Jerusalem Academy of Music and Dance. Um, <laughs> but that was really fun because like we had a mutual class with the dancers where we, we all got into pairs and like I was doing music for someone's dance. So for, for her choreography. I was doing that like a few times. So it was really cool. Like, you know, that that kind of collaboration, like she, she showed me her dance and I was like, you know, coming up with music and then we had a back and forth and she was inspired by the music and I was inspired by her dance. Like, so, and eventually like a, a lot of these creations were really different than what I was doing for like student films and for, you know, for more of like the traditional field of studying music, you know, like harmony and contrapoint and orchestration and all these other things. But that's what I like about that program because it, it, you know, it had all these other um, angles to to writing music. We had um, to write to for a jazz ensemble. We like we had to write um, or arrangements for songs. So it was not just about like writing composition or you know learning the theory. It was it was more more of a like a, like there was a lot of collaborative aspects, and then there was just like really different kinds of music. Like we learned Indian music and we learned some about like Arabic mo moduses and, and scales. And so, and, and then there was like a whole instrumentation thing that yes, there was like the, you, you know, Western instrumentation, but like then we learned all about these Eastern percussions and like, so it was more, more of a rich and broad um, education about music, uh, which, which I thought was great. And then, yeah, I came here for grad school to focus on film scoring because Jerusalem 
had one class about it and then <laughs> and then I actually got like a um I I asked to just submit the final work because it was like I already knew you know it was very technical and I already knew all of that stuff from my own work so I you know I asked the professor to just submit the final <laughs> project and he let me do it and I didn't go to class and then the other class that we had was like the master's program like so that was for for master's students and I asked to join that and so they let me in just as a listener and you know he was super kind like he let me submit the works and and you know reviewed them but it wasn't for a grade or anything it was just for for me wanting to you know and I, and I remember we we analyzed scores like Bolt John Powell's Bolt um have you seen it it's a Pixar movie um no. which one <laughs> bolt it was oh, this, bolt. okay yeah i mean he went you know the incredibles he, he went a lot he loves the picture stuff so we, we we watched a lot of that and then he brought his own works like we we could you know work through that um yeah and then here i went to usc which is the university of southern california and uh it was really fun it was just one year uh, and it's very intense. It was very intense, <laughs> you know, and they teach you the Hollywood way kind of thing, which is totally different than what you do in Israel. Um, so yeah, it was really cool. I mean, I, I'd go, I'd go back there and I totally recommend that school. Yeah. Oh, very cool. So, you know, I'd like to kind of ask you about a few other things you've done uh, in more recent times professionally. And, yeah. uh, you know, I guess also as a way to kind of learn about how you do what you do. Cause that's a big thing about this show is trying to figure out what it is exactly that you do <laughs> and in general, yeah. what people do in, in, in the, in their professions. So, uh, you know, I just want to start with one I just watched the other day and I finally got around to it. Uh, I just checked out American pickle on HBO max. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I read the short story. It was based on like a year or so ago. And I really liked it. And then I found out that Seth Rogen made a movie out of it. And I was like, wow. Okay. So uh, then I found out. <laughs> You scored it. So I was like, okay, well, now I got to watch it. I, now I have a great excuse to finally sit down and watch the thing. And uh, it, it's really cool. interesting because it's got like this very sophisticated and very diverse kind of sound to it where you're basically combining a lot of different musical cues. You know, it's like a lot of modern sounds with like traditional things like klezmers and instruments like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and also what was really cool too, I found out, it's got a Star Trek connection, which I didn't even know either. You got, we already mentioned him, uh, Michael Giacono. I think I'm saying his last name right. Uh, um, well, yeah, nobody says it correctly. <laughs> yeah, so, you know what I'm talking about, Michael G who did yeah. the Abrams movies. Uh, so yeah. I know you get to work with him. So uh, I'd love yeah. to hear a little bit about <laughs> what you did with Michael, how you guys work together, if you guys work together, uh, and just tell me a little bit about how you guys put that whole score together. Okay, so first of all, thank you for watching. <laughs> I love this movie. That this is, you know, it has a very special uh, place in my heart because that was like my biggest, you know, breakthrough in my career at the time. And it's it's a very personal movie too because you know it's about this Jewish immigrant. Uh, who is brined for a hundred years. It's like a Captain America pickle really, because he's <laughs> brined for a hundred years. And then he wakes up uh, and meets his great grandkid in, in Brooklyn. And that, so, so you have that already, you have that clash of like modern and traditional versus, uh, sorry, modern versus traditional, right? Because you have this this modern um, you know kid, like he, he's like in his, his thirties, uh, millennial guy. Uh, secular who doesn't you know doesn't care about Judaism and then you have this old orthodox man <laughs> who comes from 1920 which is like a little different in values and in ideas and, and, yeah and so you have that fish out of water sense so um and or since pickle out of brine if you will yeah exactly so <laughs> since you have that like um most of the film is, is told from Herschel's perspective so you do have a, a bunch of this music that is more um klezmer and more heavy emotionally on on Herschel's perspective and then you have these like more, more modern instrumentation on on Ben the, the grandkid so you have like you know some guitar some piano um, you know, woodwinds, like I didn't use the full orchestra on his scenes until the very end where he's like, except kind of, you know, kind of a little going back to, to his origins, like, okay, he does say cottage, like, you know, that scene at the, 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 um, the synagogue, you know, that, that's like his big moment kind of thing. I'm totally ruined the movie for other people. Sorry. Spoilers. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> but, I will do much but, violence to you for spoiling this. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. I would. No one knows what we're talking about. They're not going to know, but you know. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. So it was really fun. And there's all these like aspects of, of fantasy there. And it almost has an animated quality to that, you know, that entire movie. And this was actually something the director had said very early on. He was like, I wanted to, I want the score to feel almost like an animated movie in the sense that this is, you know, this is a comedy where we're having fun. Herschel is fun. Um, and, and we're, you know, we're, you know, I, w- I want the music to, to actually be excre- expressive about a- anything that happens. So I think that was really fun. And then how it all came about, um, you know, I've, I've, I grew up on Michael's score, you know, for, for The Incredibles and for Up and, and for Star Trek. Like I, I already, you know, knew his work before Lost, you know, all these, all these shows that he did. Um, and I, you know, I, he's like a huge, you know, composer. So I never in my life imagined that I will be working with him. Um, but life has great surprises sometimes. And uh, what happened is that I pitched on this movie for, you know, I sent them my reel and I created some works, uh, you know, in order to, to be considered for this. I created two, two tracks based on the blog line that they sent like really early on. They're like, oh, you know, the Jewish immigrant makes his, you know, that, that was the, the log line and um so i submitted all of that um and uh and then after a few weeks uh my uh, so i get a call from the agency and and uh my the you know the uh, assistant she's like well i have maria machado and she, who's my agent and michael giacchino on the line for you and i'm like oh <laughs> okay because <laughs> that was like <laughs> uncalled for entirely and and then uh, I was like, well, you know, I picked up the phone. I was like, is this my birthday? And then he said, yes, uh, happy birthday. <laughs> Just wanted to wish you <laughs> because I was like, what, what is going on here? Um, and then he was like, he was just suggesting we do this movie together and you know retrospectively I know that he worked with Seth Rogen on other films um so you know something over there was like you know they they I guess they wanted to work with Michael but he was not available entirely and they did like Mariel apparently so you know someone had a very good idea of like let's have them work together and and uh, how we did that was that Michael wrote a theme like the the main the suite of the themes um <clears throat> which was like a four minute uh, sequence and then I kind of you know went 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 with it and I expanded it to a 60 something I think it was 68 eventually uh, minute score <clears throat> and then um, we, we you know he also advised me and like he, we had some meetings like it was all you know we did the whole process of, of film scoring um, so having Michael as like a, you know a mentor and later a friend like this, this was like, you know, I, I'm really fortunate, like all of this just, you know, it's like, it's like the thing, you know, you wish for as, as a young composer. Um, and that's actually how I came to track, like it's because of Michael, it's thanks to Michael, uh, you know, so I'm very grateful for all, for all of this. Yeah. Well, I raise a glass of seltzer water to you. So oh, congratulations, you. job well done. Wait, 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 wait for it, wait for it. <laughs> oh very nice you are you're clearly successful yeah this, this is a soda stream um so yeah and again if people don't know what we're talking about you got to watch american pickle on hbo max or at least read the short story by simon rich which i highly recommend also yeah i, I think simon he wrote the script for for this movie like he he actually he was a street screenwriter um yeah really so, cool so you know i want to kind of look a little bit more now you know as we look at some of these other pieces of work here before we get into trek uh on more of the technical aspects of what you do as a composer. And so I guess, you know, and this could be using any other movies as an example as you want to, but, um, you know, how do you actually compose a piece? How do you break down the different elements, these different harmonies, and basically take all this chaos and kind of distill it into just one sound that we hear at the end result? Uh, well, <clears throat> wow, this is a big question. Uh, <laughs> good one, though. So it, it depends on, like, what, what, um, what, um, Let's say what le- what what um I'm forgetting the word like what what part of the process I'm on like is this the first scene that I'm working on the movie if it's the third scene or the the tenth scene it would obviously be a little easier and I'll already have like the motifs or the themes for for the character or you know um so so that would be more you know that process would be easier so. If, if we're going to the start, usually I, I like to, you know, I watch the show or whatever piece of content it is. And I'm like, okay, 
you know, I sketch some stuff. I, I play along on a piano um, or, or sometimes I'll do it with a patch of strings or and or um, horns or whatever it is that like, you know, if it's Star Trek, I'll probably a lot of times not start with a piano, but I'll start with the sound that feels closer to, to you know, a Star Trek feel. Um, <clears throat> Or if it's something else, then, you know, a lot of times it would be a piano, a guitar, whatever. Um, and, and I'll try to come up with ideas and, and then uh, I'll develop them into like a little suite or like a little piece of music. And I'll see if, if I can do some variations. Like I'll see, for example, on Pickle, you know, that, so Michael kind of did that, or, you know, the first part bit of that. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to see what variations or how I can trim down the theme or just take a little motif and maybe put that instead of a melody, I'm going to put that as, as a, an accompanying bit of something. So for example, there is a cue. So, you know, the theme goes, da 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 right? So, for example, one of the cues had like, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to take just that little part at the beginning and put it as the background of, of, of you know, the orchestra would be like, dum bum 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 da 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 so, so all of these things, like when you derive everything from your theme, um, it, it, it makes it more cohesive. It makes it like, you know, it makes a personality to what you do. Cause I could just do, da -da 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 -da, you know, whatever generic, uh, you know, style of, of uh, um, like a, a compliment, like, and, and you don't want to do that. Um, so, so this is something I'm, I'm very aware of. Like I'm trying to do that on, on every score that I do, like, you know, even make the, the stuff that are not in the front of, of the melody, like, or they're not in the front of like the this part of the piano, but over there. Um, so, you know, the lower range to, to make that interesting as well and to make that like um, something that feels, you know, true to, to the nature of, of the music that, that I'm, I'm doing. Um, so yeah, so, and then there's the whole thing about like matching it to picture, which is the most important thing to be honest. And you always want like to not be in the way of the dialogue and you want to support that. So oftentimes, and this is, this is right for comedy and for drama and for action and for everything, you always need to find the right beats where the music would land, where the musical sentence will end and another one will begin or where there's gonna be a little tension moment or you wanna find those moments and you wanna find a way to connect them in, in the most way. And there's always one or two moments that are right for it. And if you move it a second later, or if you move it two frames later, it will be completely different and it will just not work as well. So a lot of times, like I feel once I found those moments and landed in the right spot um, and, and that helped me shape the scene, that that's what I needed. Everything else will just, you know, is, is just like, let's say aesthetics. Like, okay, well, you know, I want strings on top. Do I want the, the flute to go with, with violin one? Do I want like a piccolo on that? Do I want like uh, the trumpet to add some, some nice phrase, uh, you know, some counterpoint, whatever. Um, so, but, but as long as I have the like very initial shape, so that would, you know, it's something I would call a sketch, let's say. Um, but it really has to match the pick. Like I, I obsess about that <laughs> like a lot uh, with myself, right? Um, and I think that's that, but that that's what makes the, the viewing feel so good because because you want it to feel natural. Like you, you don't want the music to call for attention on its own. Um, you want it to, to blend well with the dialogue, which the dialogue is the most important thing. So you cannot, you know, fight it. You want it to be in the correct range. So for example, if, if, if a, an actor speaks in a lower voice, you will not want your music to be in that frequency because mm. it will clash. So you will want it to be a little, a little more up, like say a third or a fourth or a, a fifth above. Or, or the other way around. So there's like a lot of considerations that you're doing. And, you know, obviously I'm not, I'm just telling you that now it's like all, all of this is happening in the back of my head, but like, you know, this is like part of the things that, you know, if I had to say, okay, what, what am I doing? This is, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so anyway, that, that is, that is a process. And then obviously you have like, you have filmmakers that you work with. So there's direction that you need to follow. Um, and, and you have feedback and so there is a back and forth and then, you know, part of, you know, this is for people who want to be composers, but like 
you gotta always remember that this is not a personal thing. Like if they don't like your music or they are like, oh, we want something else. We want it to, to be different or like, you know, and sometimes they'll be like, you know, you have to ask questions um, to get like the answers of, okay, so what, what do you not like? And it could just be like a clarinet sound or, you know, or they're like, oh, we want it to feel faster. There's so many variants, but sometimes like it's an easy fix. Sometimes it's a big fix. And sometimes it's like, perfect. We love it. Yeah. Let's move on. So um, yeah, you, you know, you're eventually you're serving the story. You're, you're, you want to help, you know, your music needs, it's, it's not about your music. It's about the story. So it has to, you know, it has to help it. If it doesn't help it, then you're not, you know, you're a good composer, but you're not a good composer for films or, or, or TV. So you gotta, you gotta always put the, the story first. Yeah. I think a really great example of you using your storytelling within your music is uh, the Disney short that you did, which was Far From The Tree, which uh, yeah. I really love that one a lot. That's really great. Um, you know, it, it, there's basically no dialogue in that. You get some animal sound effects, mm -hmm. but otherwise, like, the storytelling is pretty much what you see visually and what you're hearing in terms of the music, which, you know, it really runs the gamut of emotions, and it is a very emotional piece. I mean, we're, we're starting out with, like, you know, very playful sounds, then very tense, high anxiety, incredibly serious sounds, and then ultimately, you know, our, our kind of musical catharsis at the end where everything comes together and we have our resolution. Um, so there's a lot that goes on. It's a very, 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 you know, it's only six minutes, a very short, short, if you will. Um, yeah. So, you know, looking at it from what you just now told us about storytelling, I'd love to use uh, Far From The Tree, if you can. Kind of tell yeah. us about what you did with that. And um, I guess go a little bit more. You've already gone very depth on this, but, uh, you know, <laughs> in terms of how you tell story with your music. Um, yeah, so it's it's kind of the same idea, like with, with Far From The Tree. Um, and great for watching that. that, that I do my homework. <laughs> More, yeah, for sure. Uh, also, just a, 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 a side note, they, these are actually recorded raccoons. Oh, wow. <laughs> they actually went and recorded raccoons, and I, I was very impressed. Because uh, the scratch sounds that, you know, I worked with, when, when I first got the, you know, very initial cut, it was like an, an you know, an animatic. Um, it it th th did not sound the way it sounded at the end. Like that was very impressive, um, the, the raccoons. But yeah, it's, uh, it, first of all, I'm really lucky to work with people who are really good at storytelling. And yeah, Natalie wrote and directed a movie that that did not need dialogue. So it was a very universal thing. And, and you know, music is also a, a universal language. So telling that story was, you know, very meaningful because everyone can relate to, to that story. Like it's so, it's so, basic you know like i mean basic in a great way like we all have parents we all we are you know a lot of us become parents after when we all make mistakes and we all you know there's there's all this like you know how, how can we make things better um and, and not <laughs> traumatize our kids so <laughs> um yeah um uh so working on that again i, I was doing a sketch i was doing a sketch this was really funny because i i was still living in uh, I lived in a one bedroom <laughs> and then I have all these Disney people coming to my one bedroom. It was very cozy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I played it for them. This was like our first, our second meeting uh, after we discussed the film and we had a, a spotting session where we like, you know, Natalie and uh, Tom, like the, the, the people um, who created it, they, they were like, well, you know, this is our ideas of what we want. They also put some camp music. Um, and, and then, but they're like, you know, let's, uh, you know, you, you do you kind of thing, um, you know, and we'll go from there, but, but also, you know, they had some directions, which was good. And I think my first decision on that was to keep the band smaller. So I didn't have trombones or, or like big brass instruments. I wanted to keep it like, you know, on a lighter tone because it is, you, you know, a lot of the audience are going to be kids and I you know that scary moment with with the uh, coyote like I didn't want it to be overboardly crazy you know it was scary enough <laughs> it's not a Don Bluth film you don't need to go all out with that exactly so I felt it would be an overkill if I do so so you do have those those instrumentation um decisions that you want to take early on because you know, also you want to be mindful of what ensemble you have, because if you will write for a big orchestra that you don't have, it will just not sound great with the small orchestra, right? Like, so, you know, this is in general. Um, so yes, yeah, so you can compensate with some media, you can compensate with, with things in the box, but like, you don't want to do that too much. Um, and you need a really great mixer to do that. So um, yeah, it's like, you want to write to the ensemble that you have. 
Um, so yeah, so I played them the the sketches and the you know it we, we went really well. And and the, I I think I had like the first part already orchestrated. Like I kind of worked it like you know I was already kind of very progressive with it. And then the second part was really just a piano sketch, but it had all the right moment. Like it it landed exactly you know how I just explained earlier. The, the landing it landed exactly on those spots that I needed it to land. And they were so happy. They actually clapped. It was like a, a really a big moment of like, yay, I guess I know what I'm doing. Disney likes it. Um, and then there was there was one part that we did struggle with because um, it was it was a little complicated because I did something that felt like the mom. So that was like or the, the second part of the film, but like um the the first bit of it when they come back like the 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 new mom or, or dad come back with their kid to the beach for the first time after a while um so uh that part took took a, a moment to figure out the tone there uh, and we did some back and forth on on that because i was like well how how you know how big is that trauma or like how you know, or are we playing from the perspective of the kid who's like super excited and, you know, is it, is it kind of the same thing over again, like the beginning? And then it also had to correspond with the beginning because, you know, we're trying to mirror, you know, to, to make, you know, to make people understand that this is, you know, the same story just in a, you know. So um, ultimately we landed in a pretty natural spot because it was like, you know, it's a little, little sadder, but, you know, more mature, more serious, more adult. And, it's, yeah, so the producer, like, uh, I think it was Ruth, um, like, she she really, she said something that really, like, kind of landed for me. I, I don't remember what exactly she said, but something about it needs to be serious. It, it needs to be adult. It's like, it's like an internal trauma, but it's not like, it's not like it's super showing outside or anything. And then, you know, sometimes those words really help me understand what the filmmakers want. Um, so yeah, a lot of times, you know, they'll talk about emotions and they'll talk about what, what you know, what the character is expressing. And, and, then, and then, you know, I translate it to music. So they don't talk to me with music terms. Like that's, this never really, like rarely ever happens. Um, but they'll talk to me in like emotions. And well, this, this movie is just so full of emotion. Like you cry and you're like, why am I crying because of raccoons? But yeah. I mean, I cried when I worked on it. Like, it's it's really great. <laughs> Trek Untold will return momentarily. Trek Untold is sponsored by Triple Fiction Productions. Celebrating 15 years in business in 2023, TFP creates 3D printed Star Trek and sci-fi inspired items that fit into any collection. Whether you're a cosplayer who wants a Starfleet phaser, a Bajoran tricorder, or a Klingon dagger, or a toy collector looking for that special accessory or diorama to make your figures truly stand out, Triple Fiction Productions has exactly what you need. And for you figure fanatics, that includes products that are the perfect size for Galoob, Mego, Playmates, and everything in between. All products are 3D printed in the US, with new designs constantly being updated on their website. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free is a great way to save money as you build your collection. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, which is a great way to save money as you build your collection. Repeat customers can sign up for TFP's loyalty program for free, where the more you order, the more discounts you receive. TFP also has a pay what you want section, where clearance or misprinted items are available at a discounted price. Best of all, every product can be shipped worldwide. As a special bonus for listeners of this show, Trek Untold has a special discount code just for you. Enter UNTOLD10 at checkout for 10% off of all orders with no minimum purchase required. That's 10% off using UNTOLD10. To see all of their products, head to triple-fictionproductions.net. Or to stay up to date on their newest products, find them on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Triple Fiction Productions, where something is only impossible until it happens. Are you looking for the perfect fashion statement to show you're a geek and proud of it? Well, welcome to Geek Girls Castle, where I make fun and functional geeky clothing and accessories for every occasion. My name is Missy, and I started creating my own gear and apparel in 2015 to bring nerdy products to the geek girl population, which does include all LGBTQA+, non-binary, and POC and BIPOC folks. 
I couldn't find anything for us gals except t-shirts. So I decided to combine my passion for fashion with my fandoms, ranging from handmade skirts with really large pockets, travel accessories like toiletry bags, luggage tags, and zipper pouches. I also embroider nerdy items for home decor like wall hangings and hand towels, and products like keychains, bookmarks, and journal covers. Need something to carry all that in? Well, I make great bags to put all those accessories into or onto. Whether you like Star Trek, Star Wars, Doctor Who, Marvel, DC, and everything else in between, there is something for every geek girl. My website is constantly updated with new styles and fandoms, no matter what time or dimension you come from. If you'd like to browse my products or ask for something custom, visit me at geekgirlscastle.com. That's geekgirlscastle.com. All right, so Nami, let's go ahead and beam back into our discussion now. Let's start talking some Trek now, because, man, there's a lot to talk about. You've got a long history with Star Trek. Uh, you know, so I'd like to kind of start at the very beginning, which was your short Trek episode Q&A. Uh, so yeah. how did you actually get the gig to work on the Star Trek show? I think you kind of alluded to it earlier, but how did you actually lock this thing in? Um, well, I didn't. Uh, this was another one of Michael's wonders. Um, <laughs> basically, uh, what <clears throat> what had happened is my agent calls me and she's like, what are you doing tomorrow for, you know, around lunchtime? And I'm like, having lunch with you I don't know I thought she was inviting me to play. and she's like yeah sure we could we could do it you know later this week but you're having you're going to the secret hideout and you have a spotting session for for a Star Trek short and I'm like what <laughs> so then it turned out that Michael recommended me for this um and Alex was open to this idea because on those short tracks they're trying new things or they've tried new teams they they were okay with diversifying like um the stories and crew and you know every every piece like that was a standalone piece um you know based on one of the like main characters or or side characters of discovery so it's not the, that's not the right word i'm translating from hebrew like a like supporting character um <clears throat> so they had the you know the, the short was pike Una and, and Spock, and it was Spock's first day on the Enterprise. And I also, uh, the very, very end of it, you see Pike. And, and that was actually a really big moment for uh, for the secret hideout. They wanted to, that to be emphasized, that little moment where we first see Pike. Um, Cause it's the Enterprise and it's like, you know, it's a cool moment. But yes, it was mainly about Spock's first day and, and, and you know, all these questions and stuff. And, and like, uh, yeah, so I kind of felt the same, <laughs> you know, I was like, this was my first day on the Enterprise too. Um, and I, I went there and uh, we did the spotting session and I was like blown away, but like by all the, like they were, they were so, you know, some, some of the people who work on this, like they're like, <laughs> you know, they are Star Trek and they have been there for like a while. Um, and there's, you know, some people who worked on even earlier shows like Voyager and DS9, like they, they have a lot of like, knowledge and like you know this is royalty for me um so it was it was amazing we, we had the spotting um and then I went home and I wrote some stuff and uh and I you know I sent it to, to Alex uh Kurtzman and he had some notes and then that came back and so the, we did do that back and forth again um and uh then we recorded it I, it was uh, at Warner Brothers uh, we had a really like a, it was a relatively small ensemble um like maybe 30 pieces but it sounded, you know, it sounded awesome. It was so, so much fun. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, I remember going, you know, out of the dub uh, and the editor was telling me, they're probably going to take you for the Pike show. <laughs> I'm like, oh, is that happening? And he's like, well, it's, you know, it's not confirmed or anything, but I think they will. <laughs> and I was like, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is your first time playing with the sounds of Star Trek. So, um, you know, and this is going to be obviously a thing we're going to be talking about throughout the rest of this interview here. But, you know, looking at, I guess, with, with Q&A first, what for you were the sounds of Star Trek and how do they come together to form a score? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, as you can hear from my scores, both for Prodigy, both for Stranger Worlds and Q&A, um, they're very much influenced by Michael's scores. Um, so, so you do have like, I love the Calvin timeline. Yeah. music and I've always felt like there's no reason why a lot of these elements will not be in the prime time like there there's absolutely no reason for this separation and I think it, it was just because no one has done it before you know and I'm like I love those stuff I'm I'm totally gonna do like things that I love and that I feel like are part of Star Trek and, and when you're telling you know 
Spock's first day, first time you're beaming in. Like this is this is an excitement thing. So from that aesthetical perspective, I was like, this this is actually going to be very welcome, I think. And then um, you know, obviously having watched all the previous shows and all the previous movies. I have my favorites, right? Like I, you know, and I, I did feel like, you know, say I'm on the enterprise, I can totally, you know, it's, it's also allowed to, um, to quote like, you know, Alexander Courage theme. Um, so, you know, I wanted to do something that would feel modern and new, but also will relate to, you know, so I was like trying to, like, you know, I was playing the, the, the fanfare on piano and I was like trying to figure out what chords I want, like, how will my, how will I make this my version and how will I make this like, you know, new enough and exciting enough and like, you know, to, to answer all these boxes of like, you know, what, what, what I'm trying to do. Um, and I think ultimately I landed in, in a good spot in, in, in a sense that like, it feels like me. It also feels like Star Trek and it also has these like cool, you know, kind of like Kelvin timeline stuff that I really love. <laughs> So it was like, you know, it was a blend. Uh, this is Q, Q and A. Um, and it had like those themes that I like, like it was, you know, I, I don't know. It was ultimately, I, I, was, I was very happy with it. Um, yeah, and it's important you be happy with it too, not just the filmmakers. <laughs> oh yeah, I think I've never heard any complaints about the music from anybody. So uh, whatever you're doing, you're doing it right. And, you know, I, I guess <laughs> kind of to follow up on that topic too, and I'm gonna probably jump around show to show as we get into this section, because it's really easy to do that when we're talking about music, but. Uh, I kind of want to get to Strange New Worlds, the episode Spock and Mock, because we're talking about basically, you know, you taking these different elements from the older shows and other inspirations from other places. And, um, you know, Gerald Freed, he's uh, the last living composer, if you will, of the original series. He actually was a guest on this show, and he did the Amok Time theme. Like, that's his song. So, number one, thank you for giving him a royalty check for that episode. Um, yeah. But, you know, again, like, using that particular song and trying to blend it into modernity, let's kind of use that as an example of, like, you know, what, what, yeah. do, you, what do you do? How does that work? You're taking this older song here, but you got to make it sound like it's, you know, the year we're in, not 1966. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this this is actually a question that is relevant to the entire show, uh, but but in particular that scene, um, I actually have the sheet music. So in in handwriting, you know that Gerald Friedman did. So it was like, first of all, it feels like a treasure that you have that. And I played it again. I am very intuitive on, on like playing things, and then I'm like, okay, I, I know what to do with it. So I played it on piano, um, and uh, and then I was like, okay, well, this is first of all, it's a dream sequence right like we know so it's when you have this dream thing it's like it's like you have a license to to be a little more ethereal or or you can go really crazy or, or you can so there, there's an extreme that you can go to because of of that dream so the idea was to intensify you know start something start start with the you know you know a, a hint of that Gerald Frid uh, score and then once we realize where we are and what this is and like okay oh god like human Spock is fighting Vulcan Spock like the, and and like this is not gonna go well but like you know that setting like I mean what they did with this picture is that they took the that original scene and and revamped, revamped it in a, in a dream like this so so they went for something that is not like you know it's a callback but it's not an entire callback so that's what I did with music it's a callback but it you know and, and once you know it goes over the top eventually at the very end of it like it goes crazy uh which you know I think that reflects like Spock's mind at that point of the timeline in the show um so yeah it was really fun to do it I hope when he watches it, if he watches it, um, I hope he approves. I mean, we'll see how how that feels. <laughs> I think he'd be very happy with it for sure. I mean, it's it's very much you, you can tell it's an homage, but it's also you took your own way with it. Uh, it's really great. Like, I I really enjoyed that that little little bit of Star Trek history with today's Star Trek in there. Yes, that was really awesome. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it was super fun to record. I think I think everyone really like the players. They they really enjoyed playing that bit because because everyone knows it and everyone loves it, and it's just. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's such a part of like a major part of Star Trek history, really. Like yeah. everyone knows that. So, yeah, it's going to be very fun for people to watch. Yeah. So uh, I don't really quite know the timeline of how you guys made the music in the studios or not. Uh, and I'm not quite entirely sure which came first for you, if it actually was Prodigy that you did at first or if it was Strange New Worlds or if they just kind of happen at similar times. Um, but this rambling question is to basically ask you about, you know, 
a lot of this was done during COVID times. So I'm wondering, you know, how much this was actually in studio when, when it came down to it actually being made and produced, how much of it was in, you know, people's different homes and it was just edited right. together. Like what was the actual process to get to a finished piece? Right. So, okay. First of all, in terms of timeline, Prodigy was first. Um, and I worked on Prodigy uh, and I, I started the pilot and I sent them the pilot and then they had like a lot of notes. And when I say they, it's Alex Grossman. Uh, and then um, there was like a whole Zoom call with, cause this was already um, kind of, no, actually it wasn't COVID yet, but it was just um, easier, I think. Wait, 2000. Oh yeah, it was COVID. Sorry, this was already 2000. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah. Jesus, I'm like mixing. Yeah, this was a year into, almost a year into COVID. Um, and uh, so animation is, is totally doable to, to do things remotely. I mean, it's not ideal, but like with post-production, you can do things remotely. Like, you know, you can edit remotely, you can create music remotely. Like, you know, I've worked, you know, when I did Absentia, which is like the first show I did was, everything was remote anyway. Like this was long before COVID. Um, Cause it was just easier. And, and like some people were in New York and some people were in Europe and some people were here and, and in Canada, like it was all around, you know, it was just convenient. Um, so it's not always a Zoom, it could be a different, you know, thing, but um, yeah. So, so uh, I was working on the Prodigy pilot and I, so I submitted that first pass. And then Alex was like wanting a very, like a lot of shifts and a lot of changes and I'm like, and like oh god like he does not like my score I was I was sure he doesn't like it and then he, he had to go on another call and so uh my showrunners Kevin and Dan uh you know completed the the call like gave me the rest of the notes um and then uh I thought okay well I'm just gonna write you know the redo you know because we always do that that's okay you know I I'm, I'm used to getting notes it's fine um, but then, uh, then Alex's assistant actually asked me to come back on a call with Alex and I'm like, oh God, like he didn't finish. Like he has more notes for me, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Where is it? Like, and they're like, shit, like he really, yeah. And then I go on the call and he's like, well, we have this other show, Strange New Worlds. <laughs> and I wanted to see if you wanted to work on that. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so this was like a complete, like not what I thought, you know? And I really wanted to work on it because I wanted to do it since it was announced really since before it was announced since um you know since q and a i was like well if they are doing a show like that i want to be part of that um so i was obviously super super excited and that also told me that i guess he does like my score i just you know i just need to do the way that he and yeah so i did i did the fixes on that and then after that he had no notes on anything else that i did uh for prodigy so that's good um yeah some i mean sometimes there's you notes know, for my showrunners but like it's it's not alex like it's yeah it's just our process um so yeah so uh we recorded that um like luckily this was when we got to record it it was already after kind of you know there's like a vaccine and people start you know feel more comfortable about being in the room um in the studio together. Uh, so we got to record, I mean, we're still re-recording the orchestra together in Europe. So it's like, you know, between six, sometimes we have like a bigger orchestra. So I think the first episode was like 64 or something. Like it was a big orchestra. Um, and then I think right now we have 55, um, but you know, it's still, it's still a big orchestra together in the room. Um, so we started with Budapest, now we're in Prague, but this is like, you know, budgets and schedules and stuff like whoever can, can take the, you know, they're both really great. Um, so that's Prodigy. And then for Strange New Worlds, uh, you know, a lot of it was also, again, remotely, like the spotting sessions are all done uh, online. Um, but where we record it, we, we do it here at Warner Brothers. And um, this is also like the, you know, there's COVID rules, but like the orchestra sits together in the same room. And that's particularly important for me as, as a composer. I am not a big fan of like striping. Um, striping is when you take just one group of the orchestra and then you record the other and then you record the other. So for example, you'll have the brass alone and then the winds alone, the woodwinds alone and then the strings alone, you know, that kind of thing. And I'm not a big fan of that because I feel, you know, having said an orchestra hasn't played flute, I, I came to play with the orchestra. I didn't come to play just with the woodwinds, you know. I want to, I think the, the music is best happening when it's an ensemble. It's like acting. 
you know, if you have one actor and, you know, there's another actor reacting to that actor, right? It's an ensemble thing. It will be a better outcome than an actor playing by themselves. And then another acting actor reacting by themselves. It's just not going to be the yeah, same. Kind of you want to have it as like one cohesive sound, not layer it, layer it, layer it, like in post. Yeah, because it's just not. It's not going to be as musical, or it's not going to have that same chemistry. Like it's, it's just not going to be the same. So I always, and I actually tried it. It was really interesting because uh, when we recorded the music for the teaser, the first teaser for Strange and Worlds, we did have to do it. Like they requested it to be striped. So we did a ver you know, a strap version, but we also took like a 2D version and guess which one's better. <laughs> <laughs> I would assume not the striped one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, uh, you kind of talked about this earlier and this is, I think the right word is motif for this. Uh, I'm not really musically inclined. So I don't know if it's the right word or not, but uh, you know, every character has their own cues or motifs uh, when you hear them. And, you know, when you hear those, you know that it's a certain character coming by. So I'll, I'll let you pick the characters you want to talk about in this case, because um, you know them, I think, more, much more intimately than I do. Uh, but kind of like walk us through the different Trek shows you've been on and how you decided what music would represent what character. Like, how did that actually work? That's a big loaded question, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. Um, I yeah, I feel I feel in Prodigy it's it's more prominent because because it's animated. So um, it's it's like um, let's say the music in Prodigy is is more focused, like focused. Uh, it's it's fat, like not fast. It's a more concentrated. Uh, it's got to kind of move. Right? Yeah, because you have so little time to tell the story. You have twenty two minutes versus fifteen minutes in in strange new world so the you know the animation moves quick quicker the transitions are faster the shifts have to happen very quickly and then the motifs will be you know relatively shorter unless it's like a scene that is more broad like let's say Dal and Gwen are sitting and then you know watching the stars so hey this is a place where I can actually play you know the, the melody longer um but yeah, so let's, for example, I don't know, Zero. Um, so Zero's theme, um, you know, it first appears on first episode when we don't even see Zero yet. Uh, we just hear their voice and, and you know, Dal hears their voice. And then, and then, you know, there's like a hint of that. And then, you know, later on you see, you know, you meet, when you actually, when we actually meet Zero at the very end of the episode and then first, uh, first you know, we call it second episode, this is actually the pilot is like a one. Um, but when, okay, so when we first see Zero, it's like uh, their full melody. And um, I wanted to do something a little more sophisticated and more like, um, so that melody is it's kind of smart. It's, it's like Zero, he's, he's, she's, no, they're both like, sorry, they, they, they are smart. We don't know if it's a, um, it's, it's kind of non-binary, right? Like, yeah. So, so the melody, I wanted to pick an instrument that would be feeling a little more natural. Um, so that, you know, to me, a piccolo is that, because if you play that on a lower octave, like, so not the super, super, super high, but like slightly lower, it's like, if it has this natural feel and like, it, it was such a different sound from the rest of the show. Like I want it to be very, very specific that we know that this, this would be a zero motif. Um, and then, yeah, I played around with it. I was like, I tried all these variations. So I do that often. Like when I pick a theme, um, I try to see how, how those variations will work. Um, and yeah, like say for, I don't know, Dr. Mabenga, this is such a different theme, <laughs> like a completely different theme. It's long, it's like emotional. It's like, it, but it also had like way more room for development, you know? Um, so yeah, uh, I'm not sure I'm answering the, the question. <laughs> well, it's a tough question to answer, isn't it? And, and I just, you know, interrupt you too. Like, you know, I want to say, it's really cool hearing just like how passionate and into Star Trek you are that like you actually know like what Medusans are and, and like all, all these things about the characters. I feel like a lot of folks who I talk to might not necessarily know that kind of stuff because it's just kind of a job, but this is something you really love doing. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, but it's the same with the Jankum, for example. I mean, you know, that that clumsiness, the stubbornness, uh, you know, you, you, wanted, you wanted his his motif or his theme to, to feel, you know, like Janka and yeah. Jason Matsuga is like, he makes it, he makes him really funny. Um, so, so there is this co comedic relief in, in that, but, but you also want to, you know, you, you know, so we have the first time he appears, uh, we have that in full, but then it comes back like throughout like all the episodes, uh, you know, sometimes it's more hidden, but it's always there. So I, I feel like those those motifs in, inform uh, 
uh, the personality of, of the show better. So I, I really like doing that stuff. Um, so yeah, I chose trombones for him <laughs> and like more of a brassy sound, like sometimes muted trumpets, things like that. Um, and then this little, little pizzicato line, that, do, 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 that thing. Um, it's a little bit of a jazzy uh, vibe there, just for him. And that's very different from the rest of the show. Like no one has like that kind of harmony there, um, kind of extended harmony. Um, yeah, so I don't know. And then, yeah, I don't know. That's all it's right. a really I, big I, question. I know it's like a really broad thing, isn't it, to ask? What was the question? <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it to a different thing that kind of goes in that same vein because it's kind of, I guess, you know, we're, we're coming down to like the personality of the characters that kind of dictates, you know, what you're oh, doing. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, you have Dal with his like, you know, what, you know, energy and like planning, and he's like, you know, no planning really, like, or, you know, he's, he's just so excited, but also like he wants to break free. He's like, um he's very self-aware like self uh indulgent let's say at the very beginning of the show <laughs> like he cares only about himself like and, and slowly he's growing into a captain seat so um i i feel the music kind of grew, grew with with dal um and gwen uh like she has this like um kind of a bell-ish motif um and then you know when she stares at the stars so the very you know and that motif goes with her like she she wanted to be in the stars she wanted to see the stars um she's questioning who she is and and like so all all these things are reflected in in her motif like you know that like it, it's it's actually a clashing clashing um uh major chords together like it's it's really weird <laughs> but like i for me it was like you know it's it's her personality like she's like well am i am i in the right you know is my dad a bad man like is this you know she discovers that she's part of the bad guys and she doesn't want that um, later on. <laughs> um, and then her theme corresponds with the diviner's theme uh, at, at the beginning. Like it's it's actually, you know, if, if you take the chords on top of it, it will be the same. Um, so they kind of complement each other. And like, um, <clears throat> so again, I did the same thing. Like I, I took the, you know, the motif and put it in, in the harmony, <laughs> like, or, you know, in the texture. So in the, in the lower strings, uh, when she's fighting them at the beginning like there's like a lot of this was like I, I scored it over a year ago but I still remember you know doing those things because it was like really important for me to to make sure that like their ideas correspond with one another um, until they're not so uh, yeah and then diviner and then you know we start he's not like a, a typical villain right like we have this um, you know he's he's not a Darth Vader like that's that's not the case <laughs> he has like a, an actual you know mission like he came from the future he's stuck he's supposed to save his people so when when you have that reveal in episode 10 it's like you know you have like that theme the von von theme and it plays you know if you go back to the beginning of the episode one you'll hear that same theme only in a very different way so, but now it's like, you know, it's almost a religious mission, like to save, you know, to save his people. This is like a really big, you know, emotional thing. Um, so you discover he's not, he's not who, you know, I mean, he's bad, he's still bad, but like, he has a reason. And it's really cool. If you, if you really just like pay attention to the music, how much information is in there about who these characters are. Uh, yeah. I think it's really cool. It's what you talked about too, about the layering too. Like if you put these two characters' musics, you know, on top of each other, like you'll see, thematic elements that tie them together that's really cool um yeah and you know kind of to go a little bit deeper into this too uh, and more deep into the personalities of the shows here you know we're talking about prodigy strange new worlds here uh, do you as a musician have any guidelines or rules that you follow to kind of make these shows sound their own you know, basically make them sound their own way uh and keep them kind of separate in your head but also just artistically and musically keep them separate and unique oh my god you know when i started strange new worlds i found myself like quoting the Prada star theme and i'm like the protostar theme is great, but it's prodigy. I cannot do that. Um, so I, I did, you know, I at the very beginning it was a little harder, but as I started working on Strange New Worlds, it kind of, you know, told itself. You know, the score kind of wrote itself. Um, you, you know, and you have like character themes, and you start, you know, developing new ideas and like. Um, it just, you know, with strange worlds, they, they, you know, they encounter all these other species all the time and they, they go to different planets. And so that score is, is constantly, you know, being reshaped and, you know, the, the, it's constantly changing. You know, there are things that will stay, obviously, like, 
main themes, main ideas. Um, but it, it just develops so much, um, uh, you know, and Prodigy also develops, but like, I, I would say it, it develops a little slower, at least on the 10th, the first 10. Um, so uh, I, I feel that's already a big gap between like a big separation between those two. And then you have this, um, again, not to say that it doesn't develop, but what I mean that musically, like the score for, let's say, um, episode 101 for Strange New Worlds sounds significantly different from episode 103 or episode 105. And like they, when they go to explore thir certain them thematic, it will be for longer, it would be for like, um, you know, a, a broader, let's say this is a bro broader feel like, okay, Spock into print, right? It's like a whole love, um, you know, love theme that that you know we we heard first in, in episode one it will come back throughout the season because um you know th that that story comes back and comes back and comes back and when we first hear spock's um, motif you know that will come back and in, in, in a way more developed way later on um and so yeah again i think i think characters and like thematic material is very different in because the characters are different. It's it's you know, <laughs> and that that what makes you know this shows this shows very different. Uh, ultimately, um, it's just you know, and then on here we're we're in the you know the flagship of of Starfleet really right like the Enterprise, <laughs> and on Prodigy we're introducing a show from a perspective of aliens <laughs> who don't know what the Federation is. And it's the first, you know, and so when you look at the first episode of Prodigy, it's, you know, it's not, Star Trek is not the first thing that comes to mind at, at the very beginning. Like later on, you know, we have Janeway, we have the protostar, that's where, where things start to land. But the idea was to introduce, you know, Star Trek to younger audiences who, did, who never watched it um, and kind of drive them into our franchise and be like, hey, Look, look at Voyager, this is great, you should watch it. Um, <laughs> which I totally stunned but like this, this is Voyager, yeah. <laughs> you should watch it. Um, but so, so yeah, and, and then Strange New World is, is already like, you know, this is so Starfleet based, this is so like, you know, but the operations of the Federation, you have this politics, you have relationships. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's focusing on a different, we're in a different time, you know, uh, on the timeline. <laughs> so all of this, <laughs> um, and, and then the score being like corresponding with like the, the original series score or th that same, and you know, the whole show is actually corresponding with the 60s, you know, that production, you know, we're trying to, to make it look like it a little bit, but in a modern way, we're trying to, the, the costume design is, is, you know, reminding of that, like, it's like a better production, but like the idea is from that original, the, the original pilot, right? So with the music, that's, that's also what I did. And it's totally not the same kind of approach as an prodigy. So yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm not good at talking about music. I'm just good at writing it. <laughs> I'd beg to differ. I mean, I think you're telling us a lot of really, really interesting things here that uh, a lot of our audience doesn't really ever get to hear. So this is pretty cool stuff here. It's really fascinating information. Okay. Um, and, you know, I, we already talked about Michael Giacchino. Uh, we haven't really mentioned Jeff Russo yet. But he was a former guest in this show also. And, you know, both guys have done Star Trek, obviously. Um, so, you know, getting to work with these, I, I mentioned you, you've gotten to work with, as I mentioned, with Michael, and I'm sure you've talked to Jeff here and there, and you've also worked with him a little bit, I think, on Strange yeah. New Worlds. Um, so, you know, with those two gentlemen who have worked in Star Trek and who are very well versed in, in Hollywood scoring, um, what have you learned from those two guys? Have they taught you anything that you've been able to use? Maybe not necessarily musically, but just, you know, life or professionally, anything like that that's kind of stayed with you? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, you, you pick a lot from every show or, or film that you work on. Uh, sometimes you pick, you know, what you should do. Sometimes you pick what you shouldn't do. Um, I think on, on Strange New World, I mean, disclaimer, on both projects, uh, you know, it's not as a collaborative process as it may sound because, um, you know, Michael wrote the, the main title for Prodigy, and that was kind of the end of it. And and so with Jeff, like Jeff did watch some of the episodes and, you know, gave some, you know, advice, but like, you know, I, I wouldn't say any of this is like, a, you know, 
I'm working on the score. So, uh, you know, this is the, the, just the extent to, to okay. explain. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like, you know, on Stranger Worlds, I had to do things really fast and very, very quickly. Um, so there was a lot of like, you know, because Jeff and I talk about what he's doing for Discovery and, and Picard. Obviously, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Picard. Like, I, I love you know, I, yeah, every time this show comes out, I'm like, I'll, I'll watch it like on, on Wednesday at 12 midnight, you know, <laughs> when it comes out. Oh, <laughs> that's how much I love Picard. And I don't care if I have like a lot of work, I will do it after, you know, if I still have to finish my work, which, you know, often happens, like I, I will, it will be like 3 a.m. and I'll still work because I watch Picard and I'm like, oh shit, I feel guilty now. Um, so yeah and then you know we also talked about how I do Prodigy like he was actually very curious about that too and, and so you know ultimately I actually went with the Michael way which I you know because again I, as I mentioned I feel having everyone in the room together all the orchestra together is something that ultimately works better for me now there is a plus of recording the way that Jeff does for example for Discovery where he does make a, a you know he he does the the brass alone and then the woods and um the woodwinds and the strings separate um and the reason you know part of the reason they're doing that is that it's easier to make edits or changes or reapply the music elsewhere which you know has been yeah it's it's not a secret it's it's okay to do that like when you need to produce six you know almost uh, 50 minutes of music every time obviously you're going to reuse some materials like you cannot physically record 50 minutes in three hours. That's, nobody can do that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we do that too in Stranger Worlds. And, and this has been done on like literally every Star Trek show except for Prodigy, um, which we are really, cause it's only 22 minutes. So I can, I can record it, you know, in, in the time that I have with the orchestra. Um, well, what I'm saying is like, I still ultimately, you know, this is the, you know, and this is a, a personal choice as a composer. I ultimately do prefer having my full orchestra in, in the room. And so, yeah, I mean, I think the thing with the devices is, is you wanna take the one that works for you, you know, <laughs> like everything has to be, you know, everyone has their, their own experience. And, and that's why I'm not a big, big on giving other people advice. Cause I always say like, hey, you know, this is you, this is how you do it. You need to feel great about how you do things. And, 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 and you know, what works for me doesn't necessarily work work for you, you know? Um, so yeah, but you know, it's really great to have like, you know, access to, to compose you know, like, like Michael and Jeff who are just like, you know, first of all, both of them are, are super, like super nice, super communicative. Like you could, you could reach out like, and, and they're, they're awesome. Like both of them are, are just really, really fantastic. Um, so, so having that support is really great. And then Jeff was so, so support. I mean, he's still super supportive. Like, you know, he'll, he'll text me like, oh, this sounded so great. Like, you know, he's, it's really great to, to receive that. Like, you know, it's, it's, yeah, to be able to, to, you know, to be a part, like, it's, it's great. I, I love it. Um, and, you know, I text him like, oh my God, I watched this, you know, that, that moment, you know, the, the cue mo and the cart, like, I, I don't want to ruin it, but, you know, for the spoilers, but, you know, I was really having a blast with uh, watching it. Like, and it's fun. It's fun. Like it's, uh, you know, I get to ask all the questions. I'm like, how did you do that? And that, you know, um, same for Michael, like it's, it's really, it's really great. Um, but yeah, I feel I feel like as as a composer or as a whatever individual, you want to develop your own, you know, way, your own technique, the things that work for you, and and apply them and and you know just just go with your way. So I cannot say that I always follow their advice on things. <laughs> so Nami, I want to spend a little time just real quick nerding out with you too, because you know, something you said earlier in this interview that I picked up on was how you know music is a language or music is like a language and. You know, Strange New World episode two, Children of the Comet. That is literally what that episode is all about. So, I mean, when you when you got that episode and you were like, "Oh my God, this is like me." Like, like how did you react to that? And did you like how it came out on screen? Well, the first thing I thought was, "Oh my God, this is this." Is, are they trying to do episode one hundred seven for for Prodigy? Because Prodigy also had um, an episode where the aliens are communicating via music, and it was very, very, very different. But when I read the script, I was like. Ugh are we doing the same thing? Like, what is this? <laughs> but it was not, it was definitely not, it's definitely not the same thing. But I like that both shows have explored this idea of music as a, as a universal language. Um, 
And then, yeah, to be honest, like uh, the children have to comment, the, the stuff that Uhura and, and Spock are, are singing and the alien music too, the, the, the stuff that the comet plays really, um, are, are the first stuff I wrote for Strange and Worlds entirely because they needed that material before they shot the, the show, <laughs> like the, before they got to that episode, which is episode two. So that was the second episode to be shot. They actually shot one or three and then they shot one or two and then they shot one or one. So it was backward, background, backwards. Um, so I did that. Um, it was really cool. And I, it, with the alien, with the comment stuff, I was trying to do something that feels so, so, so foreign to everything. So this is not our kids, all electronic, but like so weird. And I still wanted the, the melody to cut through because I sure had to sing it. And it was so different. Like, you know, Henry, the showrunner was telling me, like, we, let's do something that was not her, like something so bizarre and weird and like a melody that doesn't feel like a like a like a human melody it should feel like like a really weird alien melody and I, I remember trying so many things before I landed on this weird and I was so surprised and uh, like not surprised but like she just nailed it you know that we were out like uh, uh Celia Gooding like I mean she's a singer she's she's incredible she has a Grammy like I should have thought that you know I should have known but she was just like she performed it perfectly I'm like this is almost too perfect um so yeah it was it was really fun to work on on this episode to, to you know because because the idea of you know um music as a universe that it's very true like everyone can relate to music you don't need lyrics really um, you know, the emotions are, are there. Um, so yeah. And I love that Spock's kind of explaining that, um, you know, and, uh, yeah, I mean, there's going to be more music in the show like that, like not exactly like that, but yeah. Uh, I think music plays, plays a big part for, for Spock, um, in, in general. Are you saying we're, we're going to get strange new worlds, the musical coming soon? I'm not saying that, uh, I <laughs> not say that, <laughs> but, um, well, I mean, but even when you go to back to the original series, like, you know, I think the first, the second episode is it that, that Uhura and Spock are playing together yep. and she's playing and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, that, that idea of, of them being musical is, is, is going to come back, but also, um, you know, they're just, I like that their connection that, cause this is the, you know, on our show, this is their first kind of like, you know, now you know they're forming this relationship and it's going through the music which which i really love you know i think that's sweet so you know outside of star trek we already talked about you were born in israel i assume that means you're jewish also um and you know star trek has a lot of jewish elements in it especially that very original series i mean you know the three prominent leads there are all jewish actors uh, yeah. so i'm just wondering you know do you feel connected in kind of a special way because of that um not necessarily i mean when when you think about it our most of our producers are jewish so that that's that would be a, a more direct connection um you know akiva is jewish alex is jewish alex Gersman, uh akiva goldsman henry alonso myers and i'm not sure that jenny the writer is but I, maybe um but i remember going to the first spotting session i was actually wearing uh <laughs> Um, you know, all the QAnon stuff like the, you know, the, so <laughs> there's one of those uh, congresswomen, as she was saying like, oh, there's Jewish space lasers or something that are, yep. um, and I got a shirt that with the Jewish space lasers and I was wearing that shirt, you know, going in the mini and it's like, a, it's like, a, it, it, it's like a Hanukkah, seven, what's, what's that called in English? Um, a dreidel? Oh, a dreidel. A dr dreidel. <laughs> and it's like, laser there's like lasers and it's earth <laughs> like a really and you know the, the hebrew writing it's it's just a hilarious shirt a t-shirt and then i wore that and then the first comment from akiva was oh my god i need this shirt <laughs> it's just, it's, it was really great um but that i think that that's kind of where the jewishness ends um i mean i like discovering that like this is actually coming from from a jewish um a co coining blessing so that's that's really nice um yeah but uh, other than that uh yeah i wouldn't say that that plays a huge part um i mean i'm proud to be jewish and you know i think i'm you know <laughs> trying to do good by my people but uh, i don't practice a lot like i you know I'll, I'll celebrate the holidays that's kind of about it well, i guess kind of, kind of on a similar note then you know this is something i've, I've asked armin shimmerman on the show before uh and i'm definitely curious in your take since you're jewish you're a trekkie you're you're one of us um so you know 
Armin yeah. was Quark on DS9. He's a Frangie. And, you know, quite often for many, many decades, Frangies were kind of looked at as a negative Jewish stereotype. So I, I'd love yeah. to hear, like, what's your take on that? And how do you feel we are today now in 2022 looking at the Frangies and where they are and where we are as a culture? Well, I, you know, I never viewed the Frangies as Jewish or anything like that. If anything, it would be more like, oh, this is the American capitalism. <laughs> you know, everything is about money. Everything is about gain, everything. And I, I thought that was the criticism. I did not view them as Jews. I mean, honestly, the, the Harry Potter stuff were more disturbing to me, the goblins and all, all of that, because people were saying, oh, this is inspired by Jews. But again, I don't think that J.K. Rowling was like, oh, I'm going to do them like Jews or anything. I think that this is just the portrayal of like early anti-Semitism, like, you know, like a hundred years ago or, or 200 years ago where, you know, this was the caricatures and, and yeah, this is, this is how Jews are displayed in, in anti-Semitism, you know, I don't think she did it on purpose. And, and I don't think this, this, you know, on Star Trek was done, you know, because of like, I don't think there's a really connection there. I thought, again, I thought it was more of a, a criticism on on you know capitalism and like how you know you value everything over you know you'll sell your mom <laughs> but you know at least you got profit um but i love how they did it at ds9 where you know slowly even with the the ferengi culture you saw like some progress and you saw okay now women are you know getting clothing and now they're allowed to to work you know i loved Mugi's. um you know, her, her Mugi's role is is absolutely incredible in, in DS9. And and even the what's Rom's wife, I forgot her name. Uh, Lita. Um, Lita, yeah. Like just seeing that, like that relationship and, and like a lot of things like in DS9 really made me love the Ferengis. And there's so many humorous episodes too, but at the end of the day, even Quark is kind of like becoming a better Quark by the end of um, DS9, you know, he's, you know, he, he, he did grow, he did learn. And then you have, uh, uh, you know, the first Starfleet cadet, like all of that stuff is, is, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that shows that even in a society like that, you know, there's once it interacts with, you know, Starfleet or with Starfleet people, then it influences it for the better. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, just, I love DS9. Now I want to watch it again. <laughs> well, mission accomplished. That's all I wanted to do here today was make you want to watch DS9 yeah. again. Yeah, I know. But I, I have so many things to watch. I need to... There's a new episode of Halo. I know. <laughs> I watch a show. <laughs> I love the score. That's a great score. Um, and then there's Grace and Frankie came back and Russian Doll. There's like a lot of things I want to watch. <laughs> yeah, but they're not DS9. So obviously that should be the yeah. priority. I know. I know. Actually, I I, I have a, I never watched Futurama and I feel like that is something I have to watch ASAP. Uh, so well, that's, that's homework. Probably, yeah, that's my first on the list, I think. So Nami, as we wrap this thing up here today, uh, I just got to ask you, you've done a lot of work on Star Trek already, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more of Star Trek in the future for you and plenty of other things beyond that too. But just looking at your body of work in Trek right now, what is the piece you are most proud of when you think about the work you've done in the series? Uh, wow. I think it's probably one of the uh, Prodigy episodes. Um, not sure which. Let's see. This is a hard question. Uh, possibly episode eight or seven. I think episode seven of Prodigy. Oh, that relates to Ferengi, actually. Because um, the Ferengi theme there is one of my favorites ever, uh, like across all stuff I ever did uh but also just just that like alien stuff and like the, the music again that but but I don't know I'm proud of a lot of things uh yeah I'm proud of Janeway Admiral Janeway's um theme that it's kind of like I wanted it to feel like a continuation of Voyager like you know what what would happen you know to to the real Janeway you know after Voyager and now she's like Vice Admiral and and she's Admiral? I think she's Vice Admiral um and like, so, so I wanted it to, you know, I wanted to evoke the same feeling and the same emotion and nostalgic feeling that, you know, the big, you know, the trackies, not the kids who are being introduced to starter, but like, you know, this, this was for the adults <laughs> uh, to, to make it feel like, you know, this is the Janeway that we, we love or that we know from, from Voyager. Um, so, cause we haven't seen her since Nemesis really. Um, 
So yeah, there's a lot to explore there. Um, yeah, and then I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm really proud of Strange New Worlds too. Like I'm proud of everything really. Um, I think episode 10 of Strange New Worlds is, is probably my favorite score. And then episode two as well. It's, I, I have a lot of favorites, <laughs> but yeah, 10, 10 is, I think 10 is my favorite. Yeah, in, ter in terms of score. All right. And last thing for today, Nami, what is the best thing about being a part of the Star Trek universe? Um, the people, the, the, the people I work with, uh, I have to say, I mean, coming back yesterday from, from the prodigy crew screening, I'm like, I love, I love the people I work with. And, and it's like a whole big family of people who love Star Trek and who love, you know, the telling the story and, and love, we all, you know, we share this amazing thing together and, and we're making something truly unique and great. And I feel the same about, about the Strange and Worlds crew as well, but like, it's, it's just so that's the best part, you know, obviously it's really great to tell an amazing story, to be part of a franchise that you love, you know, to, to it's also great to watch the episode, you know, I watched 201 yesterday, I'm <laughs> like, oh, it's so good, it's so good for Stranger Worlds, um, it's so good and I, I can't wait to work on it, so, so it's, there's just the aspect of like, of like, you know, working on something that you were absolutely excited about, but it really comes down to like who you work with and and how like it's it's just you know if you feel like they're they're becoming part of your family so that's you know to me that's the, the big plus um and uh yeah i'm very grateful and fortunate like i you know i get to do things i love with the people i love so yeah well nami thank you for spending so much time with us today telling us about what you do and how you do it and you know like i have my big list of questions over here on the side and i have like so many like super technical analytical things i wanted to ask you about but I'm just like, you're so much, you know, a serious, true Trekkie. And there's like so much fun fandom things I want to talk to you about, too. It's like that kind of took priority. So, uh, you know, it's so it's so awesome to hear that someone is working on the shows that really is an actual super fan and can bring that into the into the world of the music as well. So, uh, you know, just on behalf of all Trek fans, I think we're in agreement. You're doing an amazing job and we can't wait to hear what you do next. So thank oh, you again, Nami, for spending you. all this time with us and telling us all about what you do. Thank you. Live long and prosper. <laughs> That's it for this week's episode of Trek Untold. Until next time, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Trek Untold, all one word. If you'd like to directly support this podcast, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter over on patreon.com slash trekuntold, which gives you access to some great perks that can't be beat. Or pick up some merchandise from our store, or use my Amazon shop link to check out all kinds of different Star Trek merchandise. Links for all these things are in the show notes. Shout out to Triple Fiction Productions for being a key sponsor of Trek Untold. Don't forget to check them out and all of the fine folks whose ads you've seen or heard on this podcast too. If you have any questions, feedback, or comments for the show, or would like to suggest a guest or discuss sponsorship options for any of these episodes in the future, send me a message at trekuntold at gmail.com. I hope to see you here again as we uncover more untold stories from Star Trek and beyond and get to know even more amazing people who have contributed to this ever-expanding universe. Until next time, I'm Matthew Kaplowitz, and remember, fortune favors the bold. Trek Untold is sponsored by Treksphere.com. Promoting fan-produced Star Trek content in all forms, is powered by the Rageworks Podcasting Network, and is affiliated with Nerd News Today. <laughs>